Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Jorge Perez and this is Utan Shaolin Kung Fu. Today I'm having my first interview with one of the Utan family members. Besides having an amazing martial arts curriculum, he's also a physician specialized in neurology. His name is Viet Le, and if you want to know more about him, stay with me and let's get into it. <music> Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I am very excited today because I'm here with my cousin Viedle, okay? And we're gonna have a very nice conversation. This is my first interview to one of the Utan family members, per se. And I am very excited about getting to you with this. So, how are you doing, Viet? Thank you very much for joining the channel, for supporting this project. I am very excited about having you today in this channel. I'm excited to speak to you too. Um, you know, from when we met up in Boston uh, all those years back and just through the years, especially during the pandemic and everything, um, you know, being able to talk to you and talk about the legacy in Venezuela and your competition experience, it's been a pleasure. So always looking forward to network with other people within our Rutan family. Absolutely. I really appreciate, like I said, your time here. And let's get to it. Um, I want to start the interview. Um, I don't know if you can tell me about yourself, introduce yourself, tell us something about you. Um, can you please start with that? You know, what country were you born and, and what is your profession as well? Because I think that it's uh, important uh, to understand as well. Sure. Um, so my name is Viet Le and I was born in Southern California. Uh, my family's originally from uh, Vietnam and we came to the United States in 1975 after the Vietnam War ended. Uh, I am currently 35 years old. Um, alongside uh, practicing martial arts, um, I also am a physician. So I'm specifically a neurologist specializing in dementia, uh, more specifically a behavioral cognitive neurologist. Um, I currently live in Kirkland, Washington, which is about 10 miles east of Seattle. Okay, nice. So, can you tell me when did you start practicing Kung Fu? And, and I've seen multiple videos of you performing different um, styles of martial arts. So, I'm, I would like to know more about that. Like, when did you start practicing and, and what other martial arts um, have you practiced before in your career? Sure. Um, so I started uh, martial arts at around age seven um, with uh, Northern Shaolin and Praying Mantis. At the time, like I was in elementary school and uh, my principal had hired a Kung Fu instructor in the area and his name was uh, Sifu Clive King III. He was under uh, Sifu Duke Chang. Um, and he taught um, Northern Shaolin and Praying Mantis at my elementary school. And so when we would go up to test them, we would go to the main school in Buena Park, California, which is in Southern California. Um, but I would get my first lessons there. Um, under my father's direction, because he used to be in the military and at that time, the South Vietnamese military mainly trained in Taekwondo. So okay. he basically pulled me out of the Kung Fu classes and had me do Taekwondo under another instructor, uh, Grandmaster Tom Bo in Southern California. And I stayed with Taekwondo um, and got my second degree, degree black belt. Uh, wow. Even when I was one. So I was probably, I still have my little um, ID card um, certified by the government of South Korea. And I think I was maybe maybe 12, 13, so um, pretty young. Um, but I always wanted to go back to Kung Fu again. So once I got my driver's license, I went back to my Kung Fu school and I continued to study. And then when I went to college, I did find other people in that school um, to continue to train. Um, I 
also was lucky enough to find my Shifu, my current Shifu, Shifu Jason So, who was teaching at the World Arts and Culture Department at UCLA. And he initially taught Yang style Tai Chi. He took the long form and then split it up into three parts. Okay. And I enjoyed it so much that I took that class twice. Wow. Um, and afterwards, he asked me, you know, are you interested in uh, practicing other things? And I said, of course. So I started coming out to his classes in Monterey Park. And, you know, that just was the start of a relationship that has continued on to the present day. I became his disciple uh, in 2011 uh, when I was in medical school. Okay. And I'm very um, grateful that we continue that relationship. So I'm honored to be Shifu Jason So's disciple. Um, along with that, I have done uh, many other different styles. Mm -hmm. um, and really, I think a lot of people, when they see my videos, they, they probably get the, the impression that I'm sort of a jack of all trades. And I, I wanted to personally experience those styles just to be able to know firsthand how they were like, rather than just take another person's opinion for it. Yeah. And as a function of being in so many different places because of medical school, right? So after college, I went off to Philadelphia to do a master's degree. And at that time, I couldn't find anybody in my immediate area that did anything like I was taught back at home. Yeah. So I decided to try Hungar and I studied with uh, Sifu Lan and Godzi uh, while I was there. Um, and I was able to learn Hungar. He's under uh, Yi Sunga uh, in New York. Um, and I had a great time being able to exchange ideas and, and learn about Hungar. And then when I went to medical school in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, which is on the western part of the state, I was able to find a Tibetan white crane teacher um, named uh, Sifu David Cox. Okay. And he was able to share with me his art. Um, I've had lots of teachers over the years. I, again, living in Pennsylvania because um, I was pretty close to my Kung Fu uncle, uh, Shifu Tony Yang. So I was able to um, get more material from him and his students, including uh, Sifu Jimmy Rogers. Um, I also have learned other styles, for example. Olinto Akaskrim, I got into that when I was doing my fellowship in dementia in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. So I credit him um, through Michael Malignon, Bruce Catalan, Jesse Santiago for, um, again, teaching me Olinto Akaskrim. And then I've, I've also just had private lessons with many other teachers in different styles, everything from Five Ancestors to uh, Jiplin Prey Mantis with my Kung Fu brother, uh, Philip Lay. Um, when I was living in Chicago, I learned some Xin uh, Yilche and Drunken Fist from Sifu Danny Schultz. So a lot of these things are, I, I have a core set of practices that I spent the most time on, but I've never really ceased to learn from some of my peers if they're willing to share. And so Kung Fu and its practices have a very emotional con uh, component for me, right? I think about when I practice something, I think about that friendship. I think about the time that I spent with that person, where I was in my life. Um, and since the pandemic started, I decided I wanted to at least record all the forms as a record. Um, and it's been a good kind of memory trip. So that's right? something that started after the pandemic when you started making these videos and... I started, I, rec I would record every now and then before um, but I think that I really made a concerted effort um, when the pandemic started because, because all of a sudden my clinic was closed um, at the University of Cincinnati and I had a lot of free time on my hands. I, see. I mean, remember the time when we were going to Walmart looking for things like toilet paper? Yeah. Right? That, that was, that, was that, that time. And I was kind of lonely because I was far away from home. I knew I had to be in the area in Cincinnati. It wasn't like I could go back to California because in case there were patients that needed to be seen, I still had to see them virtually. And it was an evolving situation. And so I needed something to busy myself. And God. how I did that was I made it, I made an effort to start to record everything that I could remember, right? And that would usually mean that I would ask my wife now, my girlfriend then, mm -hmm. to hold the camera while I bought her a cup of coffee 
and she would just stand there and she would tell me, look, <laughs> we're doing this in three takes. If you don't do this, we're done. Right. And so she's been extremely patient with me. I eventually got a uh, better camera equipment um, and was able to record myself without having to burden others. Yeah. And I have, I think I, for the most part, I've filmed pretty much everything. Um, I'm trying to switch my focus, especially since I live here now and I have a, a student um, that we start to do more partner stuff. I'd like to get that on film. Um, but, you know, that, that, that really is uh, just a side project. I like to be able to offer that yeah. to anybody who's interested. I don't really think there's any more secrets. And I'm pretty transparent. I, I, I first did it not, to, not for any sort of purpose of boasting or being arrogant. I was really hoping to just get other people's feedback, yeah. kind of being like a, like a beacon. Hey, if you can tell me how you're doing it, how I might be doing it wrong, I'd appreciate that guidance. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, I think that my videos have been useful. People have admitted to me that they've learned off my videos. Yeah. Right? Um, and I have no problems with that, right? Because if you spent the time to really look at that and examine it and you worked it until it becomes yours, that's basically the spirit of Kung Fu is to share, right? I, I, feel, I feel very strongly about that. So, yeah, can you tell me how have you been able to combine your extremely hard professional career with the Kung Fu? Like, for my experience, it's really hard to stay training and competing and whatever you're doing spending time doing kung fu instead of with your family or you know spending time studying for your test because i mean to get into a medical and get a doctor degree that's something that everybody considers is very hard for obvious reasons and the way that you that you've been handling that and combining it with just I mean it looks to me like you've never stopped training or learning after you explain all this you know martial arts styles that you've done and all the states that you've been living in the past couple of years and you still somehow handle how to you know stay training staying learning kung fu like you never separated from that can you can you please talk about that more give me your thoughts about it um so you know i i will admit that after college you know i did two years of a master's degree i did um medical school which took four years i did uh then i did residency in neurology which took another four years and the dementia for another one how, so how long college, how long does it take like all those years combined how many were there so i i usually tell people i did 11 years of school okay. after college right um medical school in the united states and medical school elsewhere is a little bit different because sometimes uh, a lot of countries will do a combined program of six years. Here we do four years of medical school and four years of college. So they're separate. Okay. Right? So I usually tell people I do 11 years of school after college. Um, why did I decide to continue practicing the way that I did? I'll, you know, I'll admit that it's pretty lonely in medical school, right? Okay. All you do is you, you, you're on this cycle of just trying to absorb as much information as you can, and then you spit it all out during a test and you just repeat for years and years and years. It gets a little better in residency because you start seeing patients um, and acting in a more clinical yeah. respect. Um, and then when you're in fellowship, you, you get the chance to do something very specialized. So all those years, I was, albeit pretty lonely, I was also very curious about things outside of medicine, right? And I, I, I felt that doing martial arts helped to give me a grounding, right? Well, it's so kind of like of, an escape from... Kind of an escape, a release from all the pressures that I was under, right? And I would, I would joke with my friends that so long as I had martial arts, I was doing well in school, and I had a girlfriend, 
-hmm. I was pretty good. Those were my minimal requirements to be happy for that decade of my 20s. That's all I needed. Got it. And so I decided to push that to its very limits, right? Medical school, I, I did my best um, with martial arts. If I wasn't training, I was learning, right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't, uh, I was always trying to ask questions to, to get the, the broadest picture of martial arts as I could. Yeah. Um, and then with personal relationships, um, you know, I was, eventually I did find somebody that was right for me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that I'm married now. So that's how I, I had my, I spent my twenties. Right. And because of, because of that effort, I think in my thirties, I'm able to sit back a little bit and reflect and enjoy and, and process everything that I've learned. Yeah. I mean, I learned things very quickly. I do think that I have maybe a, a natural aptitude to at least learn choreography. Do I think that I'm a, a superior fighter? No. Right. Mm -hmm. I do enjoy sparring with people, you know, that can kind of teach me how to be better, right? But do I go out there and brawl and, and you know, go into bars? And, and I don't have those stories, unfortunately. I have a pretty, quote, unquote, clean background. I did not need to use martial arts to defend myself because I've been mainly in school yeah. for most of my life. So as opposed to, I think many martial instructors that can attest to the fact, you know, when I was a kid, I was picked on. Um, and you know, I, I had a hard life. I honestly did not have a very hard life. I, I was pretty privileged. I'm, I'm very fortunate that, um, my parents were able to send me through school. Um, and I've always taken martial arts as being a, a lesson in, in learning about the history, the culture. Um, why did people move that way? Why did people act that way? Right. So I, I take it from that sort of educational perspective, historical perspective. Yep. Um, I, I've never been a, a super aggressive kind of person, right? Um, there have been moments. I know that that's a personality trait that you know I inherited from my from basically my dad. Um, but I, I think I know how to temper that, and I, I think that in conversation with anybody, whether it be a martial arts or other people. I think people would say, you know, I think that I think he knows something, but I'm not sure how much he really does it. Yeah. So I don't really open those floodgates. I, I keep a little kung fu to myself, right? Yeah. Some people, when you see them, even when you're far away, you can feel their presence, right? Mm -hmm. You can feel some kind of aura, like either they're wanting to beat up somebody. We call it like shashi, like you feel that killing energy. Mm -hmm. I think for the most part, people would say I'm a pretty <laughs> serious person, but they could sit next to me, right? We could have yeah. a conversation. We can break bread to them. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I think that's the kind of image that we want to exude in this modern day. You don't want to look like a Li Shu Wei, like a, like a god of the spear. Yeah. You don't want to look outwardly aggressive, right? Yeah. Um, really high level martial arts, the people that I've met, the people that I try to mirror myself, they look like just you and me. Yeah. Right? When you start talking to them, right, you realize that apart from their profession, that they have this discipline, yeah, right. And I think it's important that uh, our generation today, despite the fact that these arts are coming from a long time ago, we need to have something outside of our profession, right? Some kind of passion, discipline. If you like to cook, please enjoy cooking. Yes. If you like to music, you know, for example, music, for example. Which yeah, I recently got into not great. Uh, but still, I've still seen learning. some videos as well. <laughs> still learning. These things make life so much richer. Yeah. Right? Um, than simply our profession. Yeah. You know, kudos to those people who live and die by their profession, but um, I try to remain multifaceted. It, that's something that I actually heard back in the day when I was in Venezuela, that came from Grandmaster Tai Seche about in order to be an integral person you need to learn how to cook you need to learn music you need to you know obviously stay with your um, kung fu practicing every day and of course having a profession right mm -hmm. besides that that some people just have kung fu as profession and that's totally fine right but it's important to do all those things that complement your life and as a human being right sure and that's very important i agree uh and let me tell you something uh 
I don't think there's nothing to regret about not needing to use your Kung Fu skills in order to defend yourself from any situation. I think that's the best thing that could ever happen to any martial arts practitioner. Just, you know, going through your entire life and I never had to throw a punch or defend myself in a bad situation. So I agree with you. I only went through that once in my entire life and I was probably 15 years old and I was getting home and there were two kids that were painting and scratching the front door of my house. So I was I with my graffiti. sister. <laughs> I think it's graffiti. I don't know if they were painting. <laughs> they, were, they were vandalizing. <laughs> Something like that, you know? And I was angry. And I just get out of the car and started chasing these guys. Mm-hmm. I was just 15 years old. And I started chasing them. And there were two of them. And I was not afraid at all because I was so angry that they were damaging my property. So I went after them and I started kicking, punching, throwing them on the floor. And until I finally stopped, my sister started yelling at me, you know, Jorge, Jorge, stop. And I stopped and they just went away running, you know. And then suddenly, like an hour later, I'm at home and somebody knocks on the door. They ring the bell. And there was the police that came with these two kids that (laughs) happened they were one was 18 years old and the other one was 19 years old so So they were adults exactly and i was just 15 so just a teenager and then my mom started showing my ids and saying he's only 15 these guys and and then the police just had to go away you know because there was nothing to do about it but that was the only time that I needed to use martial arts. I've been practicing since 1990, so 33 years, and only once I've used it. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad that I've been through my entire life just like that, with just using it just once. I don't want to use it to defend myself. I just want it for me, you know? I want to be prepared because I, I have kids. I have a wife. So I might need it at some point, but I don't want to. So I think that's that's um, that's good that happened to you too. I mean, during all these years training and practicing, right? And, mm-hmm. and and I think that's right. So, yeah, very interesting in everything that we've been talking about. And if I can take you to, uh, I would like to know who is your master? That master that took you to the Utam family or the Utam lineage, right? If you can explain a little bit the line of succession and and how do you become a member of this Utam family or Utam lineage, right? Sure. Um, so I may have stated before, uh, I am a disciple of Shufu Jason So. Uh, the Mandarin, his name is Zhou Jiaxiang, um, and he created... Uh, teaches in the Los Angeles area. Um, how I met my Shurfu again was through taking his Tai Chi class at UCLA and eventually taking more classes in Monterey Park, California. And I continue to take private lessons with him um, until today. Um, in terms of who he studied from and how we're linked to Wu Tai, so my teacher studied with uh, Master Su Yuzhang, right, uh, who was also known as the Mantis King in Taiwan. Uh, Probably the fastest, fastest hands. Tang Lan Chuan practitioner that I've seen in my entire life. I think the clip of him doing uh, Lan Jie uh, yeah, is yeah. quite popular, especially the first part where he does this, blah, 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 right? Um, and it, it, you know, he even was able to do that even into his older age, right? Yeah. I think another uh, characteristic move is where he puts his hand on the ground and keeps oh, yeah. straight up. Oh, yeah. Um, um, often imitated by subsequent students 
but never truly replicate it. Oh no. It's, it's I've I've never been able to do it. I won't even so, try yet. <laughs> we're, we're, you know, that measure of experience, right? How he trained for his whole life and was able to keep that up for most yeah, of his life. The ability. That's something that, you know, maybe me as a hobbyist will never be able to achieve. Yeah. And that's okay. I I understand that, right? Um, so my teacher learned from Master Su uh, when he was in college. And afterwards, Master Su referred him to Grandmaster Liu Tiao, right? Liu Tiao was the one who started our Wukhan organization. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the generation name, so my Shifu would be part of the time generation, right? Okay. Um, so masters like Dai Shi Zhe, like Su Yu Zhang, like Xu Ji, like Adam Xu, um, they're all part of the, that Wu generation. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, people like my Shifu, like uh, Sifu John Hum in Canada, Sifu Tony Yang, part of that uh, time generation. My Sifu as well. Right. And then uh, we have basically us, right? The Guang generation. So that's how uh, I am linked with uh, Wukai through my Shifu. Uh, I became my Shifu's disciple in 2011. And I remember a couple months before, so I was already in medical school at the time, and I came back home to practice with my Kung Fu brothers and sisters. And in LA at the time, our classes, we had two main groups. One was a Baji group, Baji Pigua, one was a Bagua group, and I was with the Baji Pigua group. And my Kung Fu brother, uh, James Van, uh, you know, on that day looked a little different, right? He, he's usually very business, right? We're gonna work today. He's always has this towel around his neck and he does his bear walking up and down um, the, the little space that we practice in. He's sweating with, with he's usually sweating. The, the towel is always mopping with sweat. And uh, Shifu asked him to come over. He talked to Shifu really briefly and then came over to me. and talked to me as if he didn't want other people to listen. Okay. And he told me, oh, Shufu wants you to be his disciple. Are you interested? And I was like, this is the first time that I had been asked to be a formal student of anything. Yeah. Right. And I said, yeah. Um, you know, please tell me about how the process is. And that I was um, going to ask you, did you know already about, you know, what does it mean to become a disciple and the ceremony and the Paisu ceremony? Did you know all these things or it was completely new for you? I had, I had read about it. I had, I had known about it in a peripheral aspect, but I never knew what it would mean to be a disciple of my Shufu. Okay. Um, so my Shufu, when he came to the United States, he lived in Massachusetts first because he had uh, studied at Dartmouth and he had taken some disciples at that time. And then he moved to California and it seemed to me, because I, I wasn't one of his first students, right? And when yeah. he was in California and he had a school in San Gabriel and he had taken some uh, people as disciples. And then there was a long period of time where he didn't take anybody. And I didn't really get to interact with some of those older Kung Fu brothers. I, I would say that my period of studying with my Shufu was sort of a middle period, right? I wasn't one of the earliest people in the 70s and 80s, uh, nor am I considered new like the people who are just joining now, right? Um, so without that reference point, I really didn't know what that would mean to be my Shufu's disciple. Okay. I, I didn't know about what particular ceremony it was. I, I had no clue. Okay. Um, so, you know, when he, when he told me that, you know, he wanted, I, I, that he wanted me to be his disciple, I said, sure, I, I wanted to know more about the process. Um, we ended up arranging a time for the ceremony. So I discipled along with three others. Um, and we did it at a restaurant. Um, okay. It was owned by a Kung Fu Brothers. Um, and it was I, I, this is sort of a going off on a little tangent, but my mom honestly has tried to get me to stop doing martial arts or has tried to encourage me to do less martial arts because she says that I'm a doctor and you should focus on being a doctor. And my mom's a physician. 
Um, and she feels that should be my main squeeze, right? And she's also afraid that, you know, if I get engaged in martial arts, you know, I could get beat up, that, or I could beat up somebody, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, she's always been very professional, right? But it was one of the few instances that my mom actually showed up um, to a Kung Fu gathering. It was the first time that my, my Shufu and my mom met each other in person. And the next time they would meet would be at my wedding years later. I just got married last year. So, um, congratulations. Thank you very much. She didn't stay for the whole ceremony. Yeah. She was there long enough. So, so that was nice basically the first time that your mom was really supporting something about Kung Fu that you were doing. Support Somehow. might be even be a, yeah. Support might be even a, a strong word for it because I think she she showed up. Okay. Maybe she supported in her heart, right? That was the sure, way she that she was supporting up. you. Yeah, you know when I when I look back, perhaps it was right. I was yeah. hoping maybe a little bit more um, more emotion. Emotional, but, yeah. Uh, but she was there. She was there. So uh, that was significant for me. Um, and yeah, that that's basically how I am linked with the lineage. Um, I will readily say that because I was away from home for quite a bit of time, I haven't been, I haven't lived in California for 11 years. I have been able to make use of that time to exchange mm -hmm. with other members of, uh, of Wu Tan. So yeah. I spent quite a bit of time around the Ohio area, um, trying to glean material from master Tony Young and his students. Um, and I want to give credit to, uh, you know, my Kung Fu uncle and my Kung Fu cousins for sharing, right? Um, I also, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have met Kung Fu cousins like yourself, like Luis, like Mai Kwong from Wutan, New York, um, David Young, who's the head of Wutan, New York. Um, you know, it really does make you feel like part of a bigger family. Yeah, right? definitely. Um, so I, I, I've been very grateful to be part of Wu Tan and, and have other people ask me questions and me being able to ask questions of other people within the family. So. Yeah. Awesome. So Viet, um, I've seen multiple, and when I say multiple, probably, you correct me if I'm wrong, but probably more than 100 forms in YouTube and Facebook and Instagram um of you performing some martial arts okay in general obviously more than 100 um can you please share with us what's your curriculum of the forms related to utan that you know okay i think it'll be a good a good start right so everybody knows um What's your knowledge in, in this uh, lineage or sure. family? Um, I have a long answer to this question, but I'm going to try to organize it in a way that hopefully people viewing this this clip will understand uh, the breadth of Wuhan. Perfect. Right? It, it really does. You have to understand the history and where this material comes from. So let me simply split the curriculum into what I would consider the core curriculum of Wutan yep. and what I would consider auxiliary, meaning that the core is what I would say is things that were taught by Grandmaster Lu um, and were passed down to all disciples and students. Right? Perfect. The things that when, when you get together with a Kung Fu cousin or Kung Fu brother, um, you, are, you can refer to it and you are able to perform it Quite easily because that is what has been reinforced right yes um the auxiliary curriculum is because grandmaster lu took students who had already had backgrounds right so for example uh dai Shijia, he had been a student of zhang shan san so he had learned six harmony dances, yep. right um you have Xuji adam shu who had learned from han jing tang um, long fist um and afterwards, after he discipled with Grandmaster Lu, he was sent uh, to study with Du Yuzi to learn Chen Shi Tai Di Um You have Master Su, who had learned multiple lineages of Mantis. Right? Yeah. Um, so it's important to recognize those contributions to the curriculum. Right? Um, I don't consider them core because as those, the, those members of the Wu generation 
took on other students, they vary their curriculum as well, right? So Master Su's curriculum, when he taught Mai Shu Fu, uh, is quite distinct from the curriculum that he taught as Ba Ji Tang Lang uh, in Japan and in Europe, right? So how I would define this core curriculum, right? Uh, in terms of Baji, we have Xiao Baji, Da Baji, Liu Da Kai, and Baji Liu Hai, right? Those four forms, right? Um, some uh, people in the Kung Fu family do teach other forms, right? So Ba Da Zhao, for example, uh, Jin Gang Ba uh, but there is some variation in how these are taught. And I'm not going to argue about what's legitimate or not, yeah. right? I myself learned a set of Ba Da Zhao from my teacher. Um, which having conferred with others may differ yeah. uh, from other, other, other groups like Bhutan, New York, or uh, uh, maybe even in Taiwan. Yeah. But that is something that I find unique to my, my teacher and I keep it. Absolutely. Okay. So Aji is what I would consider part of that core curriculum. In Venezuela, uh, they just taught those four forms that you mentioned. Right, so I think that we have, that's the commonality, Yeah. right? Um, Piwa, uh, Piwa Yilu and Erlu, right? Uh, these, and albeit the first four lines, um, which are basic practices, so, so Pi, Bao, Zheng, Kao, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed from talking to others that we have eight lines in, uh, under my Shifu. Um The last four lines are not practiced by other lines, right? The other lineages. So I consider P, the first four lines and Piwa Yilu, Erlu to be part of that core. Right. I agree. Um, in terms of Bagua, right? Uh, recall that apart from learning from Li Shu, what uh, Master Lu also learned from Gumata and that style of Bagua from uh, semi from Li Fu. Um, so that core curriculum consists of things like Shao Kai Men, right? Sixty four poems, mm -hmm. um, Chen Lin Chen Lin Zhang, right? Or penetrating forest poem, Ying Shou, which is uh, Bagua tight hand or hard hand. Uh, Bagua Tui, which is Bagua Leg, uh, Bagua Chuan, Bagua Fist, right? Uh, Bagua Weapons, which really aren't separate weapon forms, mm -hmm. uh, but take, uh, for example, uh, Bagua Yingshou, that frame, and then you put the weapons on top of that. So uh, the deer horn knives, needles, mm -hmm. are things that we can say have been recorded of Grandmaster Lu performing, right? So we know that that was passed down. Um, uh, which is our characteristic sword form, Ilu and Erlu. Right, Ilu is the slow form, right? Uh, more meditative. That is what he originally, what Grandmaster Lu learned originally from uh, Li Jingling, right? And then Piwa Erlu, which is what other some lineages call Ba Jing Jian, right? Because it has our characteristic Fa Jing in that sword form. It's not really necessarily different. It just has a different flavor. So. Mm -hmm. We call that Kung Wu Jian Yi Lu and Er Lu, right? Uh, Piwa weapon, so Piwa Dao, Piwa Shang Dao, and then the Six Harmony Spear exercises, right? Liu He Da Qiang. Um, and I'm careful to say exercises because, as far as I have heard, um, Grandmaster Lu did not practice a spear form. He had exercises okay. that he would do, right? The form that you see commonly is something that we actually took from Long Fist and was modified. Okay. So we only have those exercises. That is considered what I would consider the core. Okay. Um, and then we have systems, practices that I would consider elective. As I mentioned before, they were brought in by students of Grandmaster Lu who had experiences in other systems, right? So, for example, um, Master Su uh, brought in a lot of mantis, right? And the mantis forms that I see commonly and that I practice would include things like we fuse seven star and plum flower together mm -hmm. from our perspective, they're quite similar to one another. So forms like Feng Wu, Ta Chui, Lan Jie, Mei Hua Lu, um, Xiao Hu Yan, yeah. uh, Xi Xing Zai Yao, right? Which, uh, we also call Zong Di Chuan, uh, Si Wu Ben Da, Zai Kui, Tao Lang Sheng, right? Um, so Mantis forms that stem from multiple teachers of Master Su. Also, we have uh, elements of eight step praying mantis, including Shi Shou, Li Pi, Xiao Fan Che, Da Fan Che, and Ba Lu Zai Yao, 
right? Most commonly, it would be commonly practiced one and maybe two, right? Yeah. The other three to six, very difficult to find. I personally learned them from many different teachers just to get the complete package. Uh, for Adam Shu, we have Long Fist and Chen mm -hmm. Style Tai So um, I did not learn the entire Jiaomen Changquan uh, system that uh, Adam Shu teaches. So I only learned uh, Tan Tui. I did not learn Cha Chuan or Pao Chuan. Um, and then he also taught Chen Style. So our Lao Jia, our Pao Chui, right? I don't have uh, Hu Wei Jia, the sudden, the thunder frame of Chen Style. Um, from Master Dai, he brought in his Six Harmony Mantis because, quite honestly, uh, Grandmaster Liu, even though he learned it um, for a time when he was touring through Shandong, he forgot it. Yeah. And he, he did not know the forms as well. I know there's been records of him being able to perform everything. But my question is, is that why didn't he teach anybody directly? I think that he knew the basics very well. He may have learned the forms at some time, but the choreography, he always deferred that to his Kung Fu brother, Zhang Shan San. Yeah. And so anybody practicing Six Harmony Mantis um, usually has either that link to Dai Shui Zhe, or they went back to the mainland and started learning from um, another progenitor of uh, Six Harmony Mantis um, in the mainland. Right? Yeah. So those Six Harmony Mantis forms, as you're well aware, um, include things like Tie Tzu, Jie Shou Chuan, Jing Li Tanghua, which is called Zhang Min Deng in the mainland, uh, Ye Li Tanghua, Shan Shou Ben, and Chuang Feng, Duan Chui, right? And Liu He Zai Yao. Liu He Zai Yao, which, albeit is a newer creation by Master Dai. Right? Oh, interesting. And I don't think that came from Zhang Shan San. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think that, uh, I think I can provide evidence to, to report that. I will I will confirm that. I'll get sure. back to you. Sure. <laughs> um, Interesting. I love that form. Beautiful. Regardless of I'm not gonna say that the forms that we have that we have now, right, are necessary exactly how they were practiced, right? Back in China, back in Taiwan. They have gone through modifications, right? My teacher has made modifications. I personally have made certain modifications, especially when conferring with other members of Kung Fu family, right? Okay. Um, but the core, the DNA is still there. Yeah. So you can't call a you can't call a duck a, a cow, for example, right? It has to there has to be something that makes sense if you're going to make that modification. Um, in terms of weapon sense, we have things like Feng Mu Guan, right? Hua Dao, uh, Lan Men Dao, and Liu He Qiang, the form, right? Mm -hmm. The six harmonies in form, which we took from Long Fist. So that is pretty much the breadth of the curriculum that I do, that I practice, that I'm willing to teach. Right? Um, personally, my core, I think, is Baji uh, and, and Mantis. I think those are the things that I favor the most. Okay. Uh, other things I practice, but I, be it, I'm, not, I'm not as good at. Right? I haven't committed that time and that energy to investigate. Um, so I can do the form. Uh, I can do Bagua. Do I have a level of understanding of Bagua that um, some of my Kung Fu brothers do? Because mm -hmm. they specialize in that style? No. I will admit that I don't. So I, I think that what I focus on and what other people may know me for um, likely is my body. Right? Good to know. Um, I'm just going to mention this one thing, what I would consider, I like to get your viewpoints about this is, you know, the thought of having like a passport, right? Mm -hmm. A Wutong passport, meaning that like, if you were to go visit other branches, whether it be within the United States, or you went to South America, or you went to Japan, or Taiwan, or Europe, um, what three or to five forms do you think that everybody should know? How can, how can you say that you're part of the time uh, and and it's by knowing these basic aspects because there's never there's never been really any standardization right um, kung fu has it's not like uh karate and taekwondo where um yeah everything is standardized things. it's not it's not vanilla right? yeah um and i'd like to get your thoughts about that because you know i think us practitioners in the united states we don't know enough about 
the South American legacy, yeah. specifically the, the Venezuela legacy, how you know Master Dai, Master Su, and Master Fu, went to Venezuela, um, and how you compare your kung fu with us. Like how how can we? What do we have in common? Yeah, right? I so, think definitely. Um, I think the core in Venezuela would be Pachi. Chao Pachi and Tapachi, okay. those two. And for Piqua, it would be Piqua y Lu. Okay. Okay, so the first form of Piqua. Okay. Um, and then as far as Paqua, I didn't grow up learning Paqua in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you a story about Venezuela, right? Because we're talking about having this Utan family uh, combined with different cultures, right? Sure. Nationalities and, and countries. Sure. Even when our grandmaster came from Taiwan, but he went to Venezuela to teach Venezuelan people, which has different type of body types, sure. for example, right? That's sure. pretty uh, important. So when I grew up, Pachi in Venezuela was something that it was just taught to a small group of people and mainly adults so they used not to teach Pachi to uh, people under 18 years old okay. and if I remember you had to be an advanced practitioner either a black belt or uh, or are, you know at least been long time practicing kung fu like uh, mm -hmm. thailand chuan mm -hmm. and they had this small group and i remember the classes were only like during the night after 8 p.m after the last class you know they used to stay they used to turn off the lights and and it was very particular right where they used mm -hmm. to practice pachi and then Pachi and Piqua, right? Those two. Um, I don't remember Paqua in Venezuela because I, I st started in 1990. I was very young. I started when I was five and a half years old. So I never learned Paqua in Venezuela. I learned Paqua when I went to visit Grandmaster Tai Se Che in Taiwan in 2016. That's when I first learned Pacwa, the Pacwa circle form, the mm -hmm. see the 64 palms, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I can tell you about. So after I became a black belt when I was just I think I was like 14 years old, I want to say something like that. That's when I started uh learning not even after 18 I started learning uh Pachi Mm -hmm. Okay, and they start with Chiao Pachi, and then Ta Pachi, and then Liu Dakai, and then uh, Pachi Lian Huang Chuan, mm -hmm. right, at the end. So those four. Mm -hmm. And not everybody knows all four, okay? Mm -hmm. That's um, something that I wanted to, to mention as well. So as far as a passport, like you're saying, I think... Chao Pachi, Tapachi, and the first form of Piqua would be something really important to to show, like in any any Utan house in the sure. entire world. Like, if you're saying you're coming from Utan, show me Chao Pachi or Tapachi, or and show me something of Piqua, right? Because those two are combined together. Sure. Um. So what do you think? I, I I agree with some parts of that. I think da baji is is you have to be you have to be practicing for a little while to mm -hmm. know da baji. So um, my my three to five forms. It's hard to restrict yourself to three, but I think that if we were talking about what are the most common things that I see people practicing, yeah, right. Um, I would agree with definitely Shao Baiji. My personal experience when I first met my Kung Fu uncle in Ohio, um, he asked me, do Shao Baiji right now. 
And after I was finished, he said, by the sounds of how you do Shabaji, I know you've done this for at least three years, right? Um, and then he said the second thing was that you're missing a couple of moves, mm. right? So you don't have this, this, and this. And I'm like, okay, well, I think that, um, you know, we may have made some modifications, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you for one, one of the modifications we do is that instead of when we do Shabaji and you start and everybody yeah. lifts their knee up, and then they sink, right? Um, my Shifu's theory on that is that if you're doing a public performance, if you're training many people at the same time, it's easier to time it that way, right? So everyone does that lift and then settles at the same time. Whereas for us, after we do the second kick, we just land, mm -hmm. right? And we land with the elbow, um, which albeit is how it's used, right? So no one is gonna lift up and then go, right? So, you know, that was one way that I got in my Kung Fu uncle's good graces because he knew that I wasn't just from anywhere. My shoulder had told him that I was gonna be there, but on top of that, he knew that I had been practicing, that I wasn't just talking Kung Fu. Right? Yeah. So I agree with Xiao Baji. Um, I think that, you know, your favorite firm, Bung Hu, should be part of that passport. now. I know that not everybody does mantis, but everybody has in one way or another experienced that form. Yeah. Right. Um, That's something I'm mentioning. I think I told you I'm working on this uh, fan pool video. Um, and the one thing I mentioned there is that I think fan pool is by far the most famous Tan Lan Chuan seven star style form in the entire world i i can't argue with that i think that I in think the entire that... internet i mean <laughs> the entire internet? everybody that yeah. knows seven star right. should know pempo right and I'll, I'll be even even you know even plum flower right I, I would add on to that right uh taiji praying man because we there's so many variations of that form. that's a thing collect variations of just bung Bu, right? yeah um, so, you know, it, it is a comprehensive form. Um, it has all the keywords to it. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think that that should be part of this passport, right? Um, I also think Shao Kai Men, which is the first form that you learn in Bagua, right? And it's so versatile because you can do it in a straight line, you can do it in a circle, you mm -hmm. can even do a two man, right? Um, and it gives people a very good introduction to Bagua. Yeah. Most systems, when they, when I talk to other people who do martial arts, or especially the Chinese martial arts, when they do Bagua, they learn a single form of eight palm changes, and that's their Bagua experience. Maybe some standing palms. Yeah. But that's pretty much it, right? Yeah. Um, for us, we really do have a system, right? Um, including not only basics but also form straight line forms, circle forms, right? Even forms that go all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. Bare hand and weapons. So that is a system, right? Yeah. And Shao Kaiman is that first step in getting that taste, right? So even for people who say that they specialize in Baji, I think everybody has experienced Shao Kaiman in one way or another, right? Um, two weapons, I'd say that I think Kong Wu Tian, it being a signature form from Grandmaster Wu, um, just the first level, maybe not necessarily uh, the Ba Ji Tian, the one where we do Fa Jing. Mm -hmm. I think that should be a part of the list, right? If you consider yourself to be at least a disciple, you should have learned that. Yeah. And then um, some kind of spear work, right? Uh, maybe not necessarily form, but you should have a working knowledge of how to do Lan Na Zha. Right? For me, it's one of the most difficult weapons to master despair i agree i mean it, it, we have that historical adage right the, yeah. the spear being the king of weapons yeah um and it's so important to not just baji training but just northern martial arts and northern chinese martial arts in general how to generate power right yeah um how to coordinate your body with another another with an object. extension of your body extension right um so 
That to me, those five would be things that if you tell me you're in Wutan, I would probably ask, do we have those? Right? Mm -hmm. And if you mention anything else, um, or you mentioned, you know, something way off track, I'd be like, uh, I, I'd question, I'd question about yeah. how involved you are, right? Because in, in certain other countries, right, uh, like I said, these a lot of teachers have experience in other things. But if you're training in, for example, Wing Chun for three years before you get to learn uh, any of those core practices that I talked about, right, um, then I question how involved are you with Wu Tai? Yeah. Right? Um, you know, the way that I learned Baji is a little different from you. I think I got it kind of nice because by the time my shrew was teaching in, in Monterey Park, we had a Baji group and a Bagua group. Oh. You start, if, you it, if you wanted to, you got to choose. You got to choose which one. But That's my shrew said, once you choose, you, you stay there. You stay there. Yeah. Right? And you don't switch or you don't do other stuff until you finish this. So yeah. I chose the Baji group and I started with Shao Baji from the very beginning. I started with pra basic practices and then I got to nice. try Baji from the very beginning out in the sunlight, in the Los Angeles sun, in the daytime, right? It wasn't dark. Yeah. Uh, everybody could see us in the yeah. elementary school, right? Um, my teacher also taught like that. I had heard from other people that when he was teaching in Massachusetts, he only taught Mantis and Bagua. Okay. Right? There was some kind of un unspoken rule that non-chinese were not supposed to learn baji oh my god okay uh, even after he died or uh, after grandmaster Lu died or things were kept in private people started learning it all of a sudden yeah right i've seen kids um, so, nowadays learning baji how do you feel about that i don't it's a strange uh because of what i told you right like in venezuela kids were not allowed to learn baji because he mm -hmm. There was a belief that you could harm yourself if you were a kid doing Pachi, since it's a very internal style. Mm. And that's how I grew up, like, you know, listening to that. And, and, and now that I, I remember last year we went to this uh, 2022 NTD uh, International Martial Arts Competition, and there were two kids doing Pachi from Taiwan mm. and I was like wow impressive you know they were really good with the pajin you could see how strong they were but just like in the that very last move right mm. um, they were really good so it, it's a strange it's a strange thing but I'm I'm starting to getting used to it right now but uh, that's how I grew up and, and it's hard to you know get around it I would say But I think, you know, for for your generation, my generation, we had to work hard to learn certain things. Whereas right now, that's at least you. the way that I teach yeah. it, I have a student right now. When he asked me he wanted to learn Baji, I said, okay, let's get started, right? Um, I think that in Wutan, we have a lot of styles which I would consider specialties, mm -hmm. right? So Baji is a specialty. It's teaching you specifically about how to fight Yeah. Right? Um, how to exert power, right? Uh, mantis is great for combinations, right? Bagua footwork, right? Um, and for people who go into these styles with no background, right? Or a background that doesn't doesn't have those core tenets of yeah. northern Chinese martial arts. You cannot go from karate to bagua, right? Yeah. Um, you need to have a core practice. Yeah. Luckily, I had my Northern Shaolin yeah. as a core practice, right? So I knew my stances. I knew the alignments, right? So yeah. six harmonies, my shoulder not to go over my hip, my elbow not to go over my knee, my fingers not to go over my toes. Um, I knew how to do the basic stretches, the basic kicks. I had that foundation. And so once I went to Baji, I could at least have, have those skill sets. Right? Mm -hmm. I noticed because of our approach in Los Angeles, where we welcome everybody, that people who would start off with just Baji, they never really got it. Mm -hmm. they, they would have to take a lot longer to understand it, yeah. right? To be able to do it, right? Um, to be able to do applications on it, right? Um, so either way, right? Whether you want to say, you know, 
spend time doing basic things like kantwe first and then or mantis first before moving to baji or you want to do baji all together from the very beginning it's about the same amount of time yeah because the person who has foundations and something else is going to get it faster yeah because they've been working at it right and if you just go into those styles and we know those people we know those people who are basically martial art nerds they've read the comic book kenji they watched anime. They just they, they played the video games Akira, like in Virtual Fire. They just wanted to watch <laughs> it because it's great, it's famous, it looks good, and they struggle. Yeah, they struggle because they haven't had that foundation. By yeah. the time you started Baji, you had already had a solid foundation in yeah. practice, and um, I think that bodes very well for your kung fu for now and also going. Yeah, forward. you have you are set up for success. You got to build a house from the. From the foundation up right yeah you can't just say hey i just want everything on top right? yeah and so, i think after that they complement each other right like right if you have a like you're saying like a very strong foundation you learn pachi then your core your previous core that was your talent trend or shaolin northern um whatever it was it will become better and stronger sure because you will be able to extrapolate all those things that you learn about Fajin in Pachi to your other forms and that will make them look much better and effective okay this notion of purity that a lot of martial artists are pushing Mm -hmm. that you know oh uh, you should only do Baji you should only do this you should only do that um I think the measure of a, of a of good martial arts, we know historically that they practice not that much material. Mm-hmm. That they eventually, at the end of their lives, they reduced it to maybe a core set of practices. Yeah, yeah. I actually was reading an article, an interview that somebody did to Grandmaster Adam Su, mm-hmm. and he was saying, obviously, this is, um, this is Adam Su a couple of years ago. He was saying, like, I would recommend just going through and consolidate everything that you know into just five, five or six things. That's it. Like, don't overcomplicate. Don't learn, you know, too many forms. Don't confuse yourself. I did it and something like that. He was mentioning. So it's it's curious that you're mentioning right that now. Right. And it, it, it makes me, you know, sweat a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's easier to learn. It's harder to reduce. Yeah. Right? And uh, Adam Shu has learned a lot. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and our, pre- our other teachers have learned quite a bit of material. Yeah. Right? What do you need is different from from what you're practicing. Yeah. Right. Um, and I go through bouts. There are instances where I feel like, you know, especially now that I have a student interested in Baji, I've been focusing on that. But once in a while, you know, now that the weather is warming up, I want to do a little bit more mantis. I want to get a little bit more oh, yeah. cardio in. Right? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually can practice Baji in my living room, mm-hmm. right? But I can't do that with Talent Tram, for example. Or it's more difficult because I need a little bit more space, you know? Right. So, and, and martial artists before, like Grandmaster Wu learned many different styles. Um, even Zhang Shansan, like his Six Harmony has elements of Seven Star in it, right? So yeah. um, we know that uh, Zhang Shansan taught Qi Xing Zaiao, for example. Mm-hmm. Right? So martial artists, these martial arts styles did not come from a vacuum. Baji did not just come out of nowhere, right? It came from the summation of experiences over many many years right these are the creation of styles right? yeah and and we should not neglect the fact that these people also got chances to interact with each other right and the minute that you touch hands with somebody you're already learning something oh, yeah. about their right? absolutely and so this notion of purity um i, I stress that i i don't think that that really is that never really happened and that shouldn't happen yeah right um you can choose to perfect certain things, but go through the experience and enjoy the experience. Yeah. When people ask you, or hey, you know, why do you practice kung fu? Right. Um, I struggled for years to come up with this grandiose explanation, and finally, I just I arrived at one conclusion: 
it makes me happy. Yeah. I love if that. It makes me happy and it doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah. Right. And it's something that you can share with people. Why not do it? Yeah. Right. Um, you know, sometimes we talk about, oh, can you use your stuff in the street? Can you use it in MMA? You know, maybe I'll use some things. Yeah. I'm not a professional fighter. I don't put in those hours in the gym yeah. to get that skill. But can I defend myself? I think I can. Right? Yeah. Um, but you should do it because it makes you happy. Yeah. Right? That's my simple reason. It, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, now I'm transitioning. And I don't want to talk about me because this interview is not about me. But I'm going to share this. I'm transitioning from being a competitor to start looking for, and, and I think we talked about it uh, like a week ago, right? Transitioning from being a competitor, uh, retiring from being a competitor that I've been my entire career, basically. And now what I want to do is start, you know, sharing knowledge, uh, understand where do we come from why the styles are like that and you know getting more education about you know the kung fu that i know the utan family and all that right and and what i found is that the competitions kept me motivated somehow and i am an individual that needs motivation and I try to find that motivation from other sources. And one of those sources was competing. Because that kept me training and, you know, like fighting for a goal. Um, you know, I wanted to obviously to win the competition, but that wasn't the goal of it. It was to keep me motivating and keep practicing and, you know, keep my health in a you know good way and my weight as well right because you start practicing all this time and then you start losing weight and you keep your no you you look good and and you are healthy and all that so when you stop competing how do you transition now to okay now what what do i do how do i muti motivate myself I, I i don't have to train for competing i don't have any more competitions so now what did I do? So, and that's one of the reasons I came up with this idea, this channel. And, and, and now this is motivating me to keep training, okay? Like I mentioned, I want to, you know, start working on those videos and, you know, with some applications and, and put it in YouTube and, and I can start sharing that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that instead of that will be kind of like my motivation uh, right now. So I'm I'm in that process right now. But yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's hard. We have to give ourselves projects to do. So yeah, um, you know, your focus maybe during competition was building yourself, mm -hmm. and now in this next chapter, it's about being able to pass that on right? yeah. through various through various means, right? Whether it be through social media, through teaching. Yeah, researching. I want, to, I want to recognize your efforts. Right? Researching as well. Right. So putting a comprehensive story together. Yeah. Right? Because you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Correct. Right? Well, I, I applaud those efforts. Yeah. But yeah, now that we are talking about, you know, competitions, and I would like to know your perspective and your thoughts about the do you like competitions? Um, do you want to share with us, with us any experiences that you have in any relevant competitions? And, and what do you think are the benefits, if any, of the competitions? And, and also, I want to finish with, can, with this question, like, can traditional Kung Fu be seen as a sport and also as a martial art at the same time so if you want to share with us your thoughts about this sure. because it's a it's a very interesting topic there are kung fu practitioners or even masters uh, that they went through their entire careers 
without going to any competitions at all. And they have their own opinions about it. How is that? They're too deadly. They're too deadly. Yeah. <laughs> if they competed, they, they would have killed somebody. But I've been reading some books about Grandmaster Adam Sue and, you know, other books I, I won't mention um, here, but uh, there, are, there are plenty of stories of masters challenging other masters. And I think that was the version of a competition that existed back in the day. I challenge you. I want to see what do you know about your Kung Fu style or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? You come with your Talent Trend Six Harmony and I will come with my Shaolin Chan Chuan and let's see who wins here. And that was literally like that, like back in the day, right? I'm talking about 100 years ago or more. So please share your thoughts about it and let me know what you think. Let me let me try to address these questions one by one. So let's just talk about competitions in the modern day, my personal experiences. So um, I will admit that I'm a, I was a little bit late to competing. So um, I really only started competing when I was in medical school. Um, I didn't really do any competitions before. Uh, when I was in high school, when I was in college. Um, was there any was, reason behind it? I think the focus because I wanted to get a medical school. And <laughs> That's a good I reason, a actually. That, right, I had a girlfriend at that time. I was, you know, involved with uh, being part of different clubs on campus at UCLA. Um, I just wasn't involved with competitions at that time. Uh, but when I was in medical school, all of a sudden I was looking for outlets outside of studying and taking tests. And competitions, competitions were a way to work up to something, right? Um, and I enjoyed that. So I, the first competitions that I did were mainly in the Ohio area. So I would compete in Master Tony Young's uh, Wutong Hall of Fame tournament in Akron, Ohio. Um, I also competed in the Great Lakes tournament uh, run by Sifu Gino Belfiore um, in the Cleveland area, right? So those were my, those were my main tournaments because they were close, right? Um, martial arts, Kung Fu competitions in the United States um, are pretty unique, right? We have very big competitions like the ones, the Guoshu's in Maryland, uh, the ICMAC in Florida, uh, I think the Golden Dragon Kung Fu Championship in LA, uh, also the Tiger Claw Tournament in San Francisco. So those are the big ones. And then you have these smaller local ones, right? Um, so I did the smaller local ones first. Um, and most recently I participated in the Golden Dragon Kung Fu Championship uh, and I was able to win grand champion in uh, last year. In oh, awesome. Congratulations. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, with that division, uh, basically it was a closed division, meaning that uh, certain Kung Fu schools would send in people that would be representing them. So I was lucky enough to be selected to represent uh, my Shufu Kung Fu School, Jason So Kung Fu Academy. And I was able to compete with others. And I'll be honest, I was, I was pretty nervous because I was the third oldest person there right so um we talked briefly before we started recording about wushu yeah and regardless of of how people might think wushu has also influenced traditional martial arts competitions right Mm -hmm. nowadays when you see people competing with forms you will see them they will toss in maybe a little bit of acrobatics into it some of them will do will stop in the middle of their form to show a pose yeah if you thought, if you think about it back in the day, if you were doing a form, you would just go through it because you were imagining you were plowing through somebody, yeah. right? You didn't stop, right? But these days, well, I need to show that I know something. So yeah. you stop and pose, right? So this influence on performance, it's already here, right? Um, of, of Wushu, right? I remember I, I went to judge a, a tournament in Houston recently and I was supposed to judge kids. And what I saw was that more than half of these competitors were actually coming from Wushu backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And it was unfortunate that the kids didn't know better, the parents didn't know better, but the teachers did. And they thought that, well, these kids are not good enough to compete in actual Wushu. So let's have them compete in traditional, we'll have them 
just sweep house, right? Get all the metals. Because we know that the, the traditional kids can't do any applic that can't do any uh, aerials, can't do cartwheels, can't yeah. do anything compared to compared to these guys. That's yeah. what Kung Fu is, right? Kung Fu is is doing these kind of things, being able to show off, right? The measure of good Kung Fu in competition should be, even if you're doing a form, is can I imagine that you can use what you're doing? Practicality, right? Yeah, the applications um, of those moves. Right. Whether you're a kid up to a, a higher level, older practitioner, that is the measure. And so if I see somebody that, you know, I feel like, you know what, if you had a spear and I had a spear, you would be able to defend yourself. I, I give you credit for that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I feel about competitions, right? I think competitions are good. I think that it's a it's an opportunity for first to work towards something to be able to compare your skill because you can't say you're you're better than anybody if you haven't at least competed against somebody, right? Number two is that it's a great opportunity for fellowship, right? A lot of times, especially during this pandemic, we feel separated in terms of distance, in terms of time. We don't get to talk to people who have similar hobbies, similar passions to us, right? And I've always endeavored to learn from people when I'm waiting to compete, right? So I, I try to learn as much about your style and talk to you as if you didn't know more about your style than I do. I've, I've read about what, where you come from and I want you to feel good about that. Yeah. Right? So I'll talk to, for example, a Tian Shan Pai person and I'll ask, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know about so-and-so master? Be like, how do you know that? I thought that was only something that we talked about within our family. And it turns out the more you confer with these individuals, you realize that there are multiple Kung Fu families that all have similar traits, right? There's no style versus style. Right? Yeah. We're all part of a, a bigger community, right? Um, to your question about can traditional Kung Fu be seen as a sport and a martial at the same time, um, we need to have sporting events, right? We need to have those attitudes about, you know, fair play, about, um, you know, being able to have ways to judge one another in terms of skill level. So yeah. um, things like, you know, form competitions, sparring, weapons sparring, push hands, I advocate for that. Yeah. Right? I advocate for those opportunities uh, for fellowship to, to exchange skill, right? Um, I know a little traditional martial arts back in the day would, would sometimes frown on competitions because they felt that, look, uh, you, uh, when we wear gloves during sparring, we can't use all our technique. Um, or, you know, when you perform and you judge a forms competition, all it is is about fancy moves, right? Those get the highest points. I think these are ways that we have to measure things, right? Um, we're back in the day where you were talking about how, you know, one style versus another style. Yeah. Right? They would do it behind closed doors or they would do it publicly in, yeah. in big arenas, right? Like we see in the movies, right? Yep. And there was this concept of key guy, right? It was basically, I'm going to go shut down your Kung Fu school by beating up your teacher. Yeah. Right? To get a certain <laughs> piece of territory within a city, right? Those yep. things did happen, right? Or if you had, you know, you're part of, of a... True stories. Yeah, caravan bodyguard agency and you're protecting you know, your client's gold right, while traveling from yeah. one place to another, you had to have those skills, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, we live in a time where we don't have those, those things happen, right? So competitions are the best way to, for us to exchange, for us to pass it down, to get people to know about what we're doing, right? Yeah. And those are important. So I am all for, you know, having these kind of sporting events, right? With still reflecting traditional values, right? Yeah. Traditional values of number one, how do we differentiate ourselves from Wushu is that it has to have some level of practicality, right? Um, I, you know, the weapons, for example, that I see Wushu people use, they're made of floppy spring steel. And oh, yeah. And making these loud noises. Yeah. Right? Um, I know that when I was judging, I saw this kid, the minute that he held his saber, he had the blade facing his his shoulder rather than outwards. Mm -hmm. The reason why is that that thing was so light, right? When you have an actual blade, it's heavy enough that you have that reinforcement. You know what the back is, you know what the blade is, yeah. right? If your thing is a piece of aluminum foil, you don't know, yeah. right? And so I didn't give that kid a great score compared to the kid who did something simple. Oh, absolutely. Did something, right? So things like fair play, practicality, um, 
you know, we're not here to show off. Yeah. Right? Those things we need to pass on, those values we need to pass on into competition. Yeah. Right? That's how I would meld those two things together. Yeah. So for me, I mean, like, you know, I've been practicing my entire life. I mean, competing. And the way I see it is uh, I think about a competition as a goal. Okay. And I want to obviously achieve that goal, which is ultimately uh, get an award, regardless if it's first place, second place, third place, whatever, right? Because I'm chasing and I'm focusing on that goal. And I'll train and train myself and I'll practice every day focusing on, okay, I have this event, this date, I need a certain amount of time to practice, train. I'll go to the gym. I'll do some weights as well. I'll do some high interval inter uh, intensity training. training. I'll do my forms. Uh, I'll do my forms slow. I'll do my forms fast. I'll do my form, you know, many, many ways. And and that's my focus, right? And I think the, uh, the reason... One of the reasons I really like competition is because you can extrapolate everything that happens during a competition and, you know, before the competition as well to your life. So life is about, uh, you know, having goals in mind right. and you need to work hard in order to achieve your goal. Right. If you don't work hard for your goals, you won't achieve them it's just as simple as that right the harder you work uh the better you will achieve those goals or the faster or mm -hmm. you know you can see it in that way too and also all those values that you start building like responsibility uh you need to be responsible if, if you have a competition so you know that you have to train right. so you just don't show up there so if you have a presentation at work, you have to practice your presentation because you can't just show up in front of a bunch of customers and just don't know what to say or do, yeah, right? <laughs> so I've been able to extrapolate that mentality and mindset mm -hmm. to my personal life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the best things that I could ever get from competition. Um, Great. That's that's what I think pretty much so Viet um, do you think these traditional styles will be lost at some point in the near future and, and how do you think we can prevent that from happening um, this is a very good question so um, I think let me let me backtrack a little bit so I think as Kung Fu practitioners, we're facing immense change, right? And the two biggest things that I think are affecting our practice is number one, MMA, and number two, the advent of social media. So MMA has been a really useful platform to examine what techniques are effective, right? The need for both a ground game and a stand-up game, right? Um, how people practice, right? these athletes right are treating it like a job right? i think it's a modern version of the ape man movie <laughs> that's a good way of seeing it right um i've noticed that there's a lot of clips online of people seeing an mma technique and they say oh that's actually choli foot that's actually body that's actually see it works it works see that guy's doing it mm -hmm. right? um there's only so many ways the body can move. And, and I, I do recognize the fact that people can independently come up with good ideas, right? Remember Conor McGregor's fight where he was using his shoulder. Everyone's like, oh, that's a bodgy shoulder. Yeah. Kind of not really, I don't know. Yeah. Right? Uh, but I think MMA has been a good platform. And the fact that we can watch these fights, right? And examine what techniques work, right? How do people set it up? That's important to them, right? A lot of times what we hear is, well, um, so and so use this technique, but we have no no way of fathoming how that might happen. And so here is another platform that we should look at. Right? Yeah. Number two, I think the advent of social media, the fact that we can pretty much see what everybody is doing in an instant, 
right? Um, none of the forms that I post are forms that other people haven't done, right? I just put it in one place, right? Um, practices, uh, sparring matches, you can call BS on anybody, right? Uh, we know that, especially in China with those, you know, Tai Chi versus MMA fights, right? Xu Xiaogong and all those things, right? That has given us a lot of perspective, yeah. right? The community, right? So how do we, how do we uh, doing traditional Kung Fu face that, right? We have to recognize that. We have to be able to have answers when people ask us, right? So for me, Wutan is very much like a living museum, right? Not a museum where we just see a bunch of artifacts and just look at it, right? These are things that we are lucky enough to preserve and we take these practices and we continue to practice them, right? Continue to investigate, continue to develop, right? Um, my teacher's applications have changed over time, right? And I have also put in my personal flavor um, after practicing with others, right? And so eventually, you know, we're not trying to make you into a Li Shu Wen, right? We're not trying to make you into a Jiang Shan San or a Dai Shu Zhe. We're trying to make you the best Jorge, the best Viet that we can be. Yeah, the right? best version of you. The mission of that tradition, right? So I think that it's important to understand that these practices, traditional Kung Fu is not something that you just talk about, that you just admire from afar. You have to bring it to the present day, right? And practice it, right? And train it. Um, and if we don't do that, then it will be lost, right? We are, we are losing ground because we have kept ourselves in a bubble, right? We only talk about what happened in the past and we do not know how yet to uh, answer these questions that people in the present and maybe in the future might ask of us. So we have to prepare for that. And how can we prepare for that? I think on a, on a small level, right? Things like, for example, hazing rituals, right? Where, you know, you would do stuff without really knowing why you did it. I don't think that's necessary anymore, right? Um, I think those practices, for example, standing in horse dance for an hour was to basically test your endurance, right? And a way for a teacher to see whether a student was dedicated enough for him to spend that time with him or her. That was part of my black belt test, having a five minute horse stance yeah. test, for example. You know, and, and I think that those are okay so long as you are explaining why things are happening. Yeah. People want to know why. People's attention spans are very limited now. They're not going to just go through something just because you told them so. Yeah. So having an explanation why, and you can use different ways of explaining things, right? So I think a lot of Kung Fu teachers historically have pulled in from traditional Chinese culture, right? So in order to learn Chinese martial arts effectively, you had to have a working understanding of the five elements, right? Of Bagua, of Yin and Yang, right? Um, of maybe some traditional Chinese medical theory, right? Hmm. Um, these days, I think now that we have understandings of biomechanics, physics, we can also add in those explanations, right? Um, to be able to make people understand and practice effectively. Yeah. So I think that's how we can prevent martial arts, traditional martial arts from disappearing, is we have to give it a new face, right? Yeah. We have to be clear in our explanations. We have to be understand that we have to be grounded in practicality, right? We have to do these sporting competitions. All of those things are essential. Yeah, uh, some of the things that I actually ask myself is what is a master? And, and what are the characteristics that you need to have in order to either call yourself a master or being a master and and I would like to know your point of view and what is the concept of a master for you and what do you think are these characteristics that a, that a, that a master should have in order to be a master okay sure. and then if you can tie that with talking about your master, your Sifu, uh, Jason Su, I would love to hear that too as well. Sure. Um, Go ahead. So how I would define 
a surefire very simply, okay, is you need to have students. So the, the essence of traditional martial arts is that it needs to be passed down, right? And so if you are calling yourself a shurful, which the same as master, let's just for all intents and purposes, and you don't have anybody to pass it on, then that martial art dies with you. So um, passing it down a lineage is important, okay? What are some qualities that get you to have students, that get you to be um, you know, a teacher? I think number one is, having that breadth of knowledge, right? So you, for people who are looking for a teacher, the qualities that you should be looking for is that, does this, does this person know the curriculum, right? Are they passionate about teaching, right? Um, another quality is that you want someone who's personable, right? You want someone who knows how to treat their students as well as masters from other styles, students from other styles with respect, right? Knows how to encourage their students to do better, right? Um, you want a, a, a teacher is somebody who is constantly improving on himself or herself, right? So we talked about this before we were recording that, you know, how we feel we could never be masters. We could never be sure fools because we're always trying to improve, trying, you know, we, we don't know what it's like to assume that title. Yeah. Um, but And I casting think of it as, as it is a too big, you know, like being a master right. for me is like huge. Like sure. if I compare myself to my Shifu, I would say like, I will never be a master, you know. And, and you know, while that's a very humble perspective to take, um, if we don't try right? And we don't try to take on students and we're just constantly in awe of that legacy. We're never going to move on, right? So I will always respect my teacher, right? Um, and I, I want to be like him and have a group of my own, right? And I think at that time, once I have a stable group and, you know, my, if my students choose to call me Shufu or teacher or master, I'd be fine with it. I'd be accepting of that path. Okay. Um, I remember at a comp at a, at a mantis gathering that we had in LA, uh, my teacher was teaching a seminar on eight step praying mantis. And some of these uh, people that we had from Texas, from uh, other parts of California, from the East Coast, from the Midwest, were all there at this conference. And they, even though I was just my teacher's assistant, they were calling me Shurfu. They were calling me master. And I was nervous because my Shurfu had never had never given me that title. Yeah. So these people were calling down, here's my teacher right here. What do I do? And he's like, you know what? For today, you're there, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> um, even down to the belt, right? Um, you know, I, I once asked him, look, everybody's got belts. I know I was a black one type, but I was wondering, what kind of belt do I have with you? And he's like, we went out to his garage and he had some old belts. Uh, like, which one do you want? you want? I got a brown belt. <laughs> I got a brown one. I was like, ah, I don't want black. I don't want white. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I'll get a brown one, right? So um, I think just the, the concept of having Shurfu, let's just have a basic defined criteria is that you need to have students, right? And you have these qualities that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a good Shurfu should not play favorites, right? They, they should have sort of even treatment across the board, right? Reasonable. Yeah. Right? Have a positive attitude, right? Um, it goes along with what I talked about encouragement, right? If you have somebody who, you know, is just negative all the time, is bringing baggage from their personal life into teaching their students, that's probably somebody you want to stay away from. Yeah, you don't want to be there. Yeah. Um, the last thing I want to mention is how, understands the fighting mind, right? So I'm a, I'm a victim of this. I know a lot of times other martial arts are the same thing as that we are practicing martial arts within a vacuum. So we only know our style. We only do these forms. We only spar with each other. Um, and we don't have those frames of reference, right? Um, I appreciate it when my Shufu can talk about things that he admires from boxing, right? From other practitioners of other styles. Mm -hmm. right? um, so he talked about when he was in competition, how he was impressed with a particular teacher uh, and his students, Gao Fang Xian, more specifically, right? And that got my interest going. And I started looking for that individual's style, lineage, and whatever. So you want somebody who 
also knows about the outside world. It's not just sitting on top of a mountain looking down at you and all the other students, right? So those qualities are important for me when I'm looking for a teacher. And it's just as important that a student fi find the right teacher as it is for the teacher to find the right student. Yeah. It's a relationship that goes both ways, right? And those, those blood, sweat, and tears, not only is the student shedding those to understand his teacher's art, but the teacher is also putting that time to sacrifice to teach this person, right? So it goes both ways, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's that affinity that brings these individuals together, right? And for me personally, you know, my Shru has been with me, you know, for so long. Um, and I've talked to him, not just about stuff with regards to Kung Fu and Chinese culture, but also things outside of that, yeah. right? I will admit my first alcoholic beverage was with my Shru after a performance at UCLA. Uh, we went out to a restaurant and he gave me a glass of wine and said, try this. And I, I, I look back at that memory very fondly. Yeah. Right? Marshall father, right? Yeah. Uh, so he is in many ways, he's been part of my life. I go to him for advice. He's a human being. He's a teacher. He's a master. Um, and I love him for all those characteristics. I share a similar experience with my Shifu. Uh, his name is Juni Zapata. And I see him as family. I mean, it's my martial father, right? My Shifu. And... And the relation that we have is just not to talk about Kung Fu. It's just, it's also to talk about personal stuff, right? And how is your family? How are your kids? And, um, hey, Juni, I, I'll send you this video doing Pempu. Can you please send me a voice and tell me where could I, uh, what could I improve, for example? Sure. So, and we keep that relation. We talk every, every week, every other week. Um, and he, I mean, he's the reason behind many things. And, and one of those things is that today I'm here in the U.S., for example. So, and I really appreciate that. That's, it's, it's great. So, um, just to finish, because uh, there are too many things to talk about yet. And thank you very much again for uh, taking the time and, and to do this interview and I think uh, your story it's a great story to share with all our Utan family and I appreciate your disposition and and support to this project and idea right of getting together and let's know each other um, like I said there there are many members of, of Utan all around the world and I'll try to interview as many as I can and know their stories so we can all know each other right that's one of the main purposes of this channel and I'm very excited about that but now jumping into it's it's related to that concept of of master that you have right like the basic characteristic is having students right can you tell me about Utan Seattle now, this new uh, idea that you came up with, I saw the logo recently, uh, I commented on it, uh, the blue logo, and can you, can you explain what is Utan Seattle and what, what's the meaning of the logo, because I'm sure there's something behind it, right, nobody knows, because you haven't shared that until now. Well, we're, the reason why I'm smiling a little bit is that the logo is still being worked on. So we don't have yet an official logo. These are just some ideas. Okay. Right? But just a little bit of background story um, as to you know why um, we're interested in creating a Wutan Seattle and hoping that we can spread the word about our style. So um, my wife and I, we moved here to the Seattle area uh, last year after getting married and we both work uh, in the area. So uh, in an effort to uh, kind of make sure that we're spreading our martial art, um, I wanted to um, create a branch and an avenue to pass that down. Um, I want to recognize the fact that uh, along with myself, 
uh, my Kung Fu cousin, uh, Mike Huang, who uh, actually trained at the Wutan New York branch. He's actually here as well. Um, so we have been working together. Um, we're still in the growing stages. Um, yeah. we, we're a very small group right now. Um, but I hope that we can continue on this endeavor and grow, right? Um, so the logo that I created for Hutan Seattle, uh, first off, is based on the flag of Seattle, um, just because we're here, right? The, the, the choice of the color teal, I think in, in Hutan, we do a lot of black and white. Yeah, uh, everywhere. And, or maybe even gray. Yeah. Um, and it's a little drab. Um, I think teal for here, because it rains a lot and there's a lot of water around the Puget Sound, mm -hmm. um, I think that I wanted to recognize the elements. Right? Oh, okay. So just, and the fact that, you know, water is so fluid, right? It can become different states, solid, liquid, and gas. Um, that's kind of how we do our Kung Fu, right? We have times when if we're standing, we're trying to be as solid as possible, yeah. right? And if we're going through a whole sequence of forms, we're like liquid. And then when we're fighting you, you don't even know where we're coming from, right? So that's kind of why I chose something not like black and white. Right? I see. Be water, um, my friend. That's a Kung Fu, water, my friend, Kung Fu joke. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you notice the, the, the logo that I sent you right now, right? It's just a bunch of interconnecting circles. Yeah. Right? Um, and basically what I wanted with that, with that circle and how it's interconnecting, number one, it symbolizes those waves that we yeah. see so much around this area. The other thing is that there's a, there's a feeling of interconnectedness. So, um, I'm hoping that by having a group, we are working together. We are examining these martial arts here. We are a, a small community, right? Um, looking at these martial arts objectively, right? So that's basically my my vision for the logo, right? I see. Uh, again, just to sum up, the the blue, the teal, to simulate the water that we see all the time around here, whether it's coming from the sky or out of the coast. Uh, the white uh, represents purity. Uh, the interconnected waves. I just the, the, basically symbolizes our fellowship together as a group. Got it. That's pretty much it. Um, in terms of you know my contact information, I'm going to give you my contact. So um, you can contact me through my email or my Facebook. I post quite a bit, so um, I think that's one way of contacting me. We are taking students, um, and I teach in Kirkland, uh, which is about 10 miles east. It's not too far from Seattle, and I'd be interested to hear back from anybody who's interested. Absolutely, absolutely, and I'll make sure that I put those um the social media information uh in this video and as well as in the description and everything so anybody that is in the area can contact you and and start practicing hopefully and start this journey right sure um just like we did years ago so i want to thank you again for being with me in this space this is your house uh, thank you for sharing all those stories, all that knowledge that you've been building over the past uh, years. And that's very admirable to me. Um, being a doctor, being a professional and still continuing to practicing and, and still trying to spread this Kung Fu with students as well. That means a lot and and I encourage you to keep doing that because that's a great way of and we do have uh, we made a promise as disciples of continuing with this um, legacy okay and that's something that we should do as disciples as well and being part of this Utan family so thank you very much again um if you want to say just a few words before we finish this interview please go ahead sure um i just want to you know thank you for your time uh and thank you for your endeavors to bring our organization uh, down to a level where we can see each other and share with each other um i want to recognize the fact that you know even though we call each other kung fu cousins i see you as a brother um, you know, somebody who's very like-minded and that's, that's pretty rare. So I'm very lucky to know somebody like yourself. Um, Thank you. and yeah. I, I want to just be able to say kudos for starting this channel 
Um, and I look forward to all the other interviews that you're going to do. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for watching us. And please give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. There's so much more that it's coming, and I want to share it all with you. Thank you, and have a, have a great day. Take care. Take care.